Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. I'm thrilled to have a distinguished guest with us today, none other than the brilliant author and relationship expert, Dr. Heather Brown. Dr. Brown's latest work, Speaking with the Heart, Transforming Your Relationship and Communication with Compassion and Connection, has been making waves, resonating with those seeking not just relationship advice, but a transformative journey towards deeper connections. Now, I had the pleasure of immersing myself in the rich tapestry of insights that Dr. Brown has woven in this book. And let me tell you, it's nothing short of extraordinary. In my hands, I hold a guide that transcends conventional relationship wisdom, seamlessly blending theory with the raw authenticity of lived experiences. Dr. Brown's strength lies in dissecting complex relationship dynamics, offering practical solutions that transform this book into more than just a theoretical exploration, but a manual for building and sustaining meaningful connections. In my review of Speaking with the Heart, I found myself captivated by its holistic approach, tackling not only the surface-level issues, but also inviting readers to embark on a transformative journey with themselves and with their partners. Dr. Brown's insights on family, money, and the intricate dance of intimacy go beyond the ordinary, encouraging introspection and fostering a deep appreciation for the intricacies of relationships. And today, my conversation with Dr. Heather Brown promises to be an exploration of the transformative power of communication, a love letter that precedes any spoken word. So without further ado, let's dive into the wisdom and revelations that Speaking with the Heart has to offer with my dear friend, Dr. Heather Brown. So guess what went live last (laughs) night? What went live? One guess, my baby. Your baby? Oh, your book. Yup. It's live on Amazon. Right now. Oh, congratulations. It will be completely linked. It's on my link tree, got that done. It will be completely linked to my webpage later today. She's doing a pop-up for me. But yeah, last night, it was perfect because it was between clients. So I had 15 minutes to send out like a real quick little email (laughs) and that's it. What a gift today is because I get to start the day with you. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'm doing one more podcast and I don't have clients. So I can just reach out to those 115 people who have said, as soon as it's live, let me know and be like, it's live. So that is fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Keep your fingers crossed for me because I hired a PR person, which I, you know me, like I just do it all on my own. But my publisher said, Heather, I'm paying for your book to be published. Use the money you would have spent if you were publishing your book and get PR. Because you'll go way further if you do. And a PR rep will get you into places that sweet, kind, lovely Heather will never get into. So she reached out to me today and she said, I'm only telling you this. I'm not telling anybody else. She says, I have a contact at the New York Post and they're interested and you're in the pot to be considered for a Valentine's Day post. And she said, keep every part of your body crossed. And I said, yes. And then I said, well, a couple people have mentioned like, Good Morning America and USA Today and Women's Day, like these massive things. And she said, yeah, I'll be pitching all of them today. And I went, Oprah. Yes, she will. She said with Oprah, though, she said the challenges with Oprah and with most of the big news places, they want you six months prior. They want to see what your pre-sales are to see if you really oh, are going right. to be big Mm. because they want to invest in somebody who already has the huge following, not necessarily be the one that turns them over, though that would be lovely too. So she said the chances of Oprah doing it might be tough because they really want the pre-sale. That's just not me. So there we go. I'm sending Oprah a book and this is what I'm doing, Peter. 
My daughter's an artist. And so I told her, I said, I've reached out to the icons for me, like Esther Perel, Joe Dispenza. Like I've reached out to these huge icons and said, I'd love to send you a copy of the book if it's something that you have time for. You've been massively influential in my work. And then, of course, I'd love feedback. So Esther Perel and, and Tony Robbins, they've all said, thank you so much. Of course, we don't have time. And I completely understand that. But I'm sending it to Oprah and Brene Brown without sending that letter because I just want to send it. Miriam Williamson, like, will she have a chance to read it while she's going for the president? My daughter, I've hired her to make handmade Valentines because my thought is the carpet of my book's a heart, speaking with the heart, bringing yourself, being open and veil. It's not cookie cutter. And so when they open up the package, they're going to see a handmade Valentine. And my yeah. thought was, I bet some people will open it up simply because it's handmade. Mm. But here's a little. <laughs> Joe Dispenza's assistant, Rachel, who's lovely, wrote me back and she said, Heather, what a beautiful letter. I'm so glad Joe has changed your life in so many ways, as he has so many. Clearly, he doesn't have time with his schedule. And she said, but the team would love to receive a digital copy of your book. So. I sent it and I said, anything that you need, anything that you want, keep me posted. I'm just going to leave this in your hands. I'm not going to bug them because I did yeah. send them the live link yesterday and said, just want to let you know it is now live. And then I'll just leave it to the universe. It's like a party, isn't it? What do you do if you want people to come? You send out invitations. Exactly. So you're going to laugh at this. So about a week and a half ago, I hit that place. I'm sure you hit them too. I hit that place where I'm like, is anyone even going to buy it? I've put $20,000 into this stupid book and <laughs> my time and I have a date and, and I just want a boyfriend. And is this going to take away from me being able to retire? And what do people hate it? And they come back with all this crap on me. And God, being the amazing God that he was, slaps me on the side of my head. And he literally says, Peter, he literally says to me, oh my God, I love him so much. He literally says, Heather, it's just a book. And I went, what? And he says, no one cares. It's just a book. They don't care if you spent three years. They don't care if you spent $20,000. That was on you. And he said, why did you write it? Why did you write it? And I said, to bless people. And he said, that's all this is. And that is what this is. So with that, I have this beautiful place of peace, which just said, this is exactly what it is to be. I brought it through, I think, beautifully. And it's going to do a lot of good. I'm really excited just to see who it touches and who it blesses mm. and what comes from it. And who will it inspire? What will be the application? What kind of healing will it cultivate? Because there are so many blessings in the book that... I believe that people will receive it as a gift and a blessing. And I think you hiring a PR person, beautiful, fantastic. Yeah. And it's a huge achievement. It's huge. Writing a book is, you've got to you look at the word being in discipline, but that's being in disciple. You're being in discipleship, Ooh. right? You're being in discipleship to something higher that allows I you. I love that. Yeah. That's what discipline is, in disciple. Oh, I love that. But that's Thank what, you. Because it really isn't about you. No, it's not at all. It and, is. And that's, and that's why God so needed me to get out of the way. No one cares about Heather. Yeah. And, and that truly is what I want. I don't want them to care about me at all. They can say she's a cool chick. But I want them to move into the process of doing the connection, mm. doing the compassion, not say, oh, Heather wrote such a great book. Heather's amazing. Let's hear about her life. No, I want to buy my wife flowers. I think I want to buy some new lingerie. That's <laughs> what I want the thoughts to be for them to have. Yeah. Not about me. Yeah. 
in but in another sense it is about you because in one sense there is nothing more familiar as yourself and in another there is nothing as mysterious as yourself so in this vast tapestry of life no one individual is more important than another we're all threads woven together each with our unique color and texture and pattern and it's through our collective efforts our collaboration and our mutual support that we can create something beautiful and meaningful as you have done you've composed something you've authored something this is self-authorship but really it's on behalf of something much much higher because what i was gleaning from reading the book is that there are micro-coded compact essences that are engraved into the narratives that provide a remedial balm, a healing, if you will, for people to be able to take on board. In other words, reading through the chapters, I can see through the narrative and the exercises that, oh, I can change the way I'm thinking or how I'm thinking. I can change the narrative. I can change the timings of my conversation. And it's these simple things that you've authored, that you've put in the book, that for me is a work of art because it allows people to heal because people need application, not just an academic perusal or an academic pursuit. They need application. They need practical toolkits of understanding. So if someone says, what's the best way to have a conversation? You're going to say, be respectful, take turns, have empathy. You're going to say all this kind of stuff. If someone says, how do you take care of your body? We're going to say, drink lots of water, get lots of rest, eat lots of vegetables. If you're not a vegetarian, have lean meats. Otherwise, have a lot of soy. Limit sugar, limit alcohol, limit salt. We know it. We know it. What are you putting in your mouth? (laughs) And that's the same thing here. Mm. And I know that's why people enjoy working with me, because I bring them back to the place of the knowingness they have inside. And they say, I know this. And I say, So now let's find out how we can bring it into an active state where it moves it away from a doingness, but it turns it into a love expression for yourself, a love expression for your partner. Because we're so caught on to-do lists, I have to, that it puts us in such a negative, resistant, I don't want to be a part of this is more work, this is more effort. And especially in a relationship, that can happen a lot. Do I have to love you? Do I have to do all these things? And my brain just sits there and goes, oh my gosh, we are so not on the right place. It's wild to me. And I know I'm like calling myself out on this too, because I know I have a hundred percent been in this place. So I have to own that. But it's wild to me when we get to that place where we don't want to love someone else. Mm. What a hard, lonely, sad place to say, no. I'm not going to give you the best of me. I don't want to share with you who I am. I'm not going to let you be important in my life. And there's times when we need to do that because the person is simply not safe. But when the person is safe, and I do see that with couples, and it always breaks my heart. Like, why would you not want to feel loved? And they get focused on, I have to do it for the other. And it's because someone has to start. So oftentimes there's that lack of understanding that, oh my gosh, seeing someone light up, Seeing someone come to orgasm, seeing someone hit their dreams or be so pleased with themselves. Maybe it's because I'm a mom, but I find that so glorious. Mm. I find it so glorious to know that I get to be a part of someone's life, be, be it a friend or a partner or a client, and watch them thrive. But I think it's because in my lifetime, I've let go of the belief that anybody else being amazing has anything to do with the wonderment of me. But it's your living fire. It's the flame that ignites our spirits and allows them to flare brightly. And when we tap into this inner fire, it becomes a beacon radiating out from us like droplets of white light, sparking a sense of inspiration and possibility in those around us. You think about the times when 
you felt truly moved, truly touched by someone else's presence or words. It's as if their energy seeps into your very being, seeps into your sinews, touching your soul and igniting a fire within you. And whether it's it's through giving a TED talk, writing a book or simply being authentically yourself, you have the power to transmit this energy to others. And this transmission is healing. It provides people with the practical tools they need to navigate life's challenges, to dig themselves out of whatever hole they may find themselves in. And it can save marriages, relationships, and most importantly, it can save one's own soul. Because at the core of it all is self-love. And self-love begins with authenticity. And when we embrace who we truly are, when we allow our inner light to shine brightly we give ourselves permission to love and to be loved so i think there is a striving to be beacons of light in this world where you and i can guide others towards healing towards growth and towards love because authenticity is a precursor to self-love 100 percent, and that's always the key to me i had a client just the other day and they were with some friends and the friends have a lovely relationship at this present time. And she was sad and a little bit jealous when she came to session. And I wanted to make certain that I was very kind and gracious for her experience. Mm. And then I said, this is so beautiful. This is so good. And she looked at me and she said, what? I said, do you know what you have just done? And she said, no. And I said, you have opened up the door for you to have similar to that for yourself because you're calling it in yeah, and you want it. And what I really hope you'll start to say is it's right there. It's right before my eyes. It's like right here. It's all around me. I am a part of it. And I'm just waiting for that moment to arrive. And she went, really? I'm like, think about it. Think about it. One of your very best friends is an absolute bliss. You are in that energetic with her. You're a part of that. And now it's just recognizing she can be a mirror of you or you can be a mirror for her. And how do you want to do that? And so I'm looking forward to seeing how this shifts her in her awareness of who she is and how she lives her life. It's so powerful when we recognize what we're seeing is what we are both ways, the glory and also some of the places that are a little dark or a little hard or a little rough for us to see if we will soften and release. Life is our greatest teacher and it's an expensive teacher. It doesn't come cheap, but it's in those dark, challenging moments where the most profound lessons lie. If we can only acquiesce or surrender the need to control every aspect of our lives. So instead of constantly striving to be the center of gravity, perpetually busy and overbearing, we have to learn to let go and allow life to flow through us. Now, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me because I'm not advocating for a turn on, tune in, drop out mentality. What I'm suggesting here is that These dark moments serve as opportunities for reflection, much like stepping back to capture the entire scene in a wide angle photograph, because when I'm out there with my camera to take an image of a landscape and I want to get the whole thing in, I need a broader perspective so I can really appreciate the intricacies, the textures and the subtleties of that landscape or the subtleties of life. So sometimes it's only by distancing ourselves from the heart of the matter that we can start to gain clarity and insight. So I think it's important to embrace life's challenges as valuable lessons and step back to see the bigger picture so that we can start to uncover the hidden truths that lie within. I agree. I agree. And sometimes it's not at this moment in our life. I've had things that have happened. And then 10 years later, I'll say, oh, that shifted me in this direction. And this wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have shifted in that direction. So it's, it'd be lovely to be able to look back, and maybe that's what the afterlife is, the tapestry of our life and how things have interwoven and veered and moved. 
when we get to that place where things aren't right, where it isn't working, what's so interesting to me is that so many of us fall into that place of struggle, complaining, being critical, instead of recognizing this is here because there's something of me that is not able quite yet to move to where I am to move or it won't be that. We tend to focus on the thing. Oh, this is so frustrating. I hate this. Why does this always happen? Da, 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 da. Instead of realizing it's us. And in that embracing of the situation, in that place of loving myself, oh, I'm not very patient, am I? Mm. I have a hard time sitting in discomfort right now. What is that? Let me breathe into this. Let me breathe into this. Then you move. But we get so focused on the it, just like relationship. If only you would change, then I would be good. You made me angry. You did this. This isn't of me. I just want to love you, but you mess it all up. It's so funny because we're so focused on looking at ourselves in lack of taking responsibility for ourselves. I'm supposed to have it exactly the way I want to have it. You are the problem. And now I'm going to focus on you to fix everything for me because that's what's important. It's just so interesting how we get so botched up. And why is that spark that when you first initially meet, becomes so confused later on? We're in fantasy. Who the person is, they totally like make us feel all yummy inside. And so then we go to, oh, are you the one? And (laughs) if you've got good chemistry, that thought pops up pretty quickly. Mm. Oh my God, I'm so attracted to you. I love the way I feel with you. And there's a lot of aspects of how do we do life similarly? Do we have similar interests? But I think it's, I do know what it is. Because in the beginning, we only feel that if we open ourselves to loving that person exactly as they are. And then what happens is we keep looking. And when we keep looking, (laughs) then we don't like what we see. And we no longer love them. So we'll say, Mm. oh, they're really judgmental or, oh, they pick their nose. What it actually is is that we are seeing things and now we are pulling. They were that person. They were the nose picker sloppy when you first met them. You just weren't aware of it. It didn't bother you because you didn't see it. You just didn't even know. But it's such a key because is it part of them? Yes. But if I don't know it, if I don't see it, I don't experience it. And so then, therefore, it's not a problem for me. But once I start to see it, then turns into the place of, now that I see this of you, what do I do with this? Because I loved you before I saw this. And now I've seen this. Is there a way for me to stop looking at it so much and be so fixated on it? Or no, is this really something that means we're not okay together? But once again, in my opinion, That's not the other person failing you. It's you being very decisive Mm. about what you will choose and what you won't choose. Red flags. I see a lot of red flags in him. What you're really saying is I see a lot of places that I'm refusing to go. Yeah. Nothing wrong with the guy. He can be however he wants to be. That's his choice. But when we fall in love, it's because we're in that magical, wonderful, I can do anything. However you are is wonderful. I just want to be with you forever. And then reality hits and we're like, oh, I don't like doing this with you. There is a lot about seeing the person in different situations. Yeah. Like you need to see the person in anger because that can be a very dangerous place. I think you need to see them around animals and people and children to see the compassion and the kindness of their heart. In the context of a loving relationship, you cannot just love the bits you like. You've got to take on the whole package, warts and all. 100%, because there's going to be more of them the older we get. You you met me when I was 20. I had a couple of wrinkles. (laughs) Now, and wait 30 more years, I'm going to have a lot. You've opened the beautiful door. There's the place of, are you loving the person because of these aspects of them? Are you loving the person? My dog is 14. Sweet, sweet grizzly, such a sweet boy. He's got all sorts of little tumors and he's got lots of little white hairs and he's got something with his eyes. It's not cataracts. It's nothing they, they fix. It's just for older age. His breath is getting stinky. His like little feet from time to time and licks them. And I'm like, I love grizzly. And that's just part of who he is. Now, if you say mm. to me, Do you like his, the smell of his breath? No, I don't. I love my dog. 
I love my dog. And so that's the difference. If I were to say, I love Grizzly because he has a kind heart, because he has beautiful eyes, because he has this, that's why I love Grizzly. Then I'm loving components of him. Mm. I think there's a little breath that needs to go beyond that then turns in, and therefore I love him. It does start with components. Oh my God, he has the most beautiful eyes. I love his eyes. Ooh, I love his voice. It's almost like the person is a puzzle before us and we start putting the pieces together. Beautiful eyes, gentle heart, great with his family, social awareness. And we start putting it together. And there'll be some places where there's like some holes, most likely. And there's the place of, okay, maybe that's a place that I help touch upon. Maybe that's something that I just do on my own with somebody else. I don't need you to have every component that I want to to be of me or experience of me. But are we loving the person because of their aspects or are we truly loving the person? I don't know why I've never had this thought before, but what an important thought. Mm. And I think that's the failure for so many relationships. I love you because you turned me on. I love you because you provide for me. I love you because you take care of me. Because when you do, and I I think a lot of couples don't, but when you do, and when your partner is hurting, you're not irritated that they're hurting. You feel badly that they're hurting. Mm. When they're angry, you realize they're scared. And I think that's why in my book, I talk about that. There's a lot of talk about what do you particularly need when you're angry? What do you want from your partner when you're scared, when you're fearful, when you're overwhelmed? Because to me, once again, that's the bridge. How do I care for you? How do I love you in a way that supports you in the emotional state that you are in? And when you do that, whether they say, just give me space and leave me alone or hold me, then you're part of helping them. And I think this is probably our ego in this, but our ego is part of why we're human. That helps me love you more. If I know that who I am and how I am benefits you in your life. And that then takes you to a more healthy place. And then I have a partner who's more healthy and you do the same for me. Then we're this beautiful support of alchemy. But it, once again, it's coming from the heart. I want to love you. I want to care for you. I want to support you. I want to be your partner. Not just, I want to shack up. You make me feel good so you can stick around. No, it's companioning, isn't it? I know it's an old word, but it's companioning through life. And that life. better than partnering. It's companioning. Because the impact of love and the intricate challenges that many couples face is in maintaining that very deep and lasting connection. And I think we have to acknowledge the, the common challenge of sustaining this enchantment over time. Which I know- is so delicious. In your book, you talk about reflecting on the pervasive issue of failing relationships and the statistics reveal a significant number ending in divorce. And those are quite alarming statistics. And it urged me to reconsider the conventional approaches to love because as we plunge into this journey, the emphasis is on the challenge of not knowing sometimes what to do or what to say which then underscores the need for guidance in giving and receiving love. And I think there's a critical truth inside of that because we often reject love unknowingly because we focus solely on what is my preferred way of receiving it. So what's the remedy? I was listening to Esther Perel's book on tape and and I adore her. I think she's so gifted in what she does. I I hope someday to actually meet her or converse with her. Very important to my journey. And she brought up something with infidelity, which Mm. I found so deeply true and shockingly obvious, though I hadn't thought about it. And she said, if you go back to 1950s, 1960s, most people didn't get married because it, it was lust and it was all passion. That was there but it was also a very good match. You wanted similar things. The roles were defined and delineated and the pact was agreed upon. You also probably possibly hadn't had sex. So when you got married, it opened up this door that you hadn't been able to go through. Okay, now let's jump to today. 
we can have the candy store get married. So the message she said is, I can have all whenever I want, however I want for the most part, no limitation. Now I get married and I get you and only you. And then we're doing something that I think is so incredibly harmful, foolish, stupid, dumb, unfortunate, which is we have changed our way of marriage. We get out, we cheat, we lie, we deceive, we stop caring because we want something more. But I don't think, and this will turn into something at some point, I don't think we approach marriage recognizing that. We say the same vows, but we break them now horrifically. I'm not saying we need to change the vows. However, I think we need to change our viewpoint on marriage. What I'm saying is I will stay with you as long as you really turn me on and you make me really happy and you make me feel great about myself and you stay in shape and you have your job. If that's mine, I better be honest about that because I am not saying in sickness till death, richer or poorer. I'm not saying that. And so I think we are creating a life for ourselves. I'll stay no matter what. And then what happens? I'm not staying for this. I think it's important for us to really evaluate what does marriage mean to us? A hundred percent. No, marriage can be completely successful, beautiful, wonderful, amazing. One of the hardest and most spectacular things that you go through in life, like being a parent, but there's a commitment and that's what's missing. I don't know why we've started to do this, but we've decided that we can have everything that we want. We're literally told that make the list of everything that you want and just focus on it and you will have it. We're doing things like makes a hundred thousand dollars a year, has a, a motorcycle, really not big things like kind heart, wise mind. And so those things change. I can lose my hundred thousand dollar job. I can, I can be in an accident, not be able to ride a motorcycle. My face might get a scar. So if our list is largely what you have, what you do, and not of who you are, oh my gosh, what happens when that person is 70, 80, 90? And they're not all those things that, that you wanted. Plus, we're now telling ourselves that our partner is supposed to be our all, our best friend, our lover, our companion through life, the person we go to with all our issues, the person to help us when we're upset or scared, our traveling partner everything. We didn't used to do that. Women used to have their women's group. Men used to go play golf. Men used to go play softball. We've changed. Mm. And COVID was a huge part of that, but even pre. And so we're making our partner our everything. And there's times when a man's way of being in the world is not the perspective that I need. Sometimes I really need a woman's perspective. Yeah. And it's important that I can go to my women friends. Sometimes I might need a different male perspective, older, younger, more connected this way or this way. We're telling ourselves, you can't do that. I have to be your everything. You can't get everything from one person. And it makes me question the word commitment, because for me, commitment is really about a reduction in options. Yes. In other words, I am not going to sleep around because I'm married. To me, that is non-negotiable. I don't care how I many wish, dancing girls you put in front of me. I wish it was. I wish it was. Well, this it, for me, though, Dr. Heather, it, that's a non-negotiable because <laughs> it's to do with respect and it's to do with being principled. I'm not holier than thou. I appreciate women. I will always talk to the waitress, but I'm not undressing her with my eyes. I appreciate beauty. I appreciate the female form. I appreciate the femininity. I, I appreciate the exquisiteness of the softness of the feminine and the divinity of the feminine. But when you're committed to that and you violate that commitment, how can you lie down next to your companion, your wife, and sleep easy? How do you do that? There's a part in the self where you have needed to go to, this is about me and you're not fulfilling me. So therefore I'm going to take care of me. Mm. And to me at that point, step out of your marriage, just step out. Yeah. If you 
don't. But here's the part that's so wild. Most people who have affairs don't want out of their marriage. They just want more. And so when I'm working with someone and the person who's been cheated on, of course, is devastated and hurt. Now, they're also coming to me. And so they're coming to me because they do on some level want to save their marriage. Otherwise, they would just split up and that would be it and I wouldn't see them. So I have to own that. Of the Mm. people I see, and those are only people who are wanting to try. But when someone wants to try, there's that place of, but you did this for yourself. And yet your spouse was not to do that. And you would have left your spouse if they did that. And how is it okay for you to go beyond your marriage because you choose to? And it's a very amazing time to sit there and see where that person processes that. Because who they are and how they are is so different because of that choice. And walking them through that, the death of their character in some ways, the death of their integrity, absolutely the death of their honesty in this particular way. And how do you walk through that and have it feel like that choice won't happen again. It's like when you tell people you'll know when you're in love. I say the same thing to people who've had affairs. You will know if the shift is deep enough, profound enough, where your partner has really recognized as much as they can what they've done. They come to a deeper place of understanding of commitment, a deeper place of understanding of true love. And there's a place where it's so beautiful and so important where they look at their partner's eyes and realize that their partner loves them so much more deeply than they have allowed themselves to love their partner. There are complexities in relationships. And to navigate the complexities of those relationships, I wonder why individuals sometimes default to giving up or seeking new partners rather than seeking guidance to mend or repair their existing relationship. I can tell you easily. It's easy and it's more fun. It's more fun to meet somebody who goes, oh, you're amazing. Oh my God, I just want to be with you. Who hasn't looked very well yet. And one thing they have to look at is you're destroying your partner. You're someone who would destroy your partner and you deceive. How Mm. how wonderful is that? There's some things there that are challenging, but it's easy. When when couples say to me, it'd be easier to walk away after an infidelity, I tell them 100% on this level. But if they have children, there's a lot to consider with that. And I'll always challenge them a little bit and I'll say, okay, but is easy always the best answer? You were madly in love with this person once. You committed yourself to this person for forever. Those aspects are also there too. You're just not looking at them right now. What if we could really get you to a place where you really care and love and support beautiful, beautiful depth of intimacy? I had one couple I worked with. It was a very odd infidelity. It was in a particular act that wasn't being shared within the marriage. And so there was an infidelity for that act. Of course, it devastated the woman. And I remember it was one of our very first sessions and we were all sitting together and he he was so committed to doing anything he could do to change this and to look at himself and figure out what had gone on to help her in the healing process. And he said, on the day that we die, you will be able to say that you were a loving, supportive, honest, beautiful wife. Mm. And there will always be a scar upon me that I was not that for you. And he cried and she cried and I cried. And I looked at them and I said, congratulations. We're moving into deep healing now. And what has happened in their marriage is glorious. It's glorious. We can't ever take away the truth of what happened or the pain that was there. How they communicate now, how they care about what is really important to the other. And for them, like so many couples, it was simply because they weren't spending that time. Here's an exercise from my book. I strongly urge everyone who is in a partnership to do it. Not right before bed, a little bit of time before bed. Ask your partner, have I missed you or have I missed something today that was important to you that you wish I hadn't missed? And then whatever they say, recognize it and respond to that so that they know that you actually do care about that. And then say, where have you felt the most loved, Mm -hmm. the most cared for, the most supported? And then share that and then say, can we go a little bit deeper? If you do that every single day, 
you will stay in love with your partner so much more easily. And you will feel a commitment with them that is very deep. And then what I tell my clients is you can no longer say, no longer, not one day for the rest of your life, that your partner has not loved you today and that your partner has not cared and that your partner has not tried to come through for you just with those two very important moments. What if in your marriage, every single day you said that, every day my partner is attentive to me, cares about me, asks about me, and cares about where I feel loved and wants to grow it. Oh my gosh, you're never stepping out of that relationship. And you're going to do so much to try to bless it. You're going to do so much to try to bless it. Because isn't that what we all want? I mean, isn't that kind of, this is a weird thought, I think, but I'm going to bring it out because it comes out. Isn't that kind of like the baby suckling on the mommy's boob? Warm, comfortable, nourishing, nurturing, connected, bonded. Like I'm helping you feed your soul. That is a natural part of who we are. We we came into the world, sperm and egg, unless we're a test tube, but still, Michelangelo, reaching. It's mm-hmm. the connection. The joining together, which then becomes the embryo, which is connected to the mom, which comes through her body, which is of male and female. Because all this gender stuff we get into, we're both. We're from a sperm and we're from an egg. It's so silly that we have such challenges with this. Biologically, there's a component of that to create us. Are we developed enough to make love and give love and receive love to each other in such a way where we can be vulnerable, we can communicate? Because how crucial is it for individuals to confront and overcome their fear of being vulnerable and truly honest to have painful clarity in their relationships? This experience is amazing and that we get to be touched and that we get to do that for another. Ten past nine years ago, but I remember this might be way too much information, but I remember sometimes after we would make love, not after sex, but after we would make love and I would say, could you just stay? And as everything was softening and being done, we would hold each other for a moment. Time why I wanted to do that. And I said, because to me, this is the most important part, connection. It's a satisfactory completion. Yes. And in staying in that, to me, it took it even further than we've had this glorious experience together. And now we're back to the two of us. It was the completion. It didn't end on ecstasy and that's great. And now let's go wash up. It ended on us loving each other and holding each other and being grateful to each Mm. other just a little while longer. It was like putting that kiss to it at the end. But the kiss was for us to have. It wasn't because of the act. Okay, this is a beautiful thought. So the kiss was not because of the act, not because of what we had done or what we had felt. The kiss was because I love you so much. And this is part of our relationship. And I want you to know that. And I think when we allow ourselves to be in that place of devotion, that place of wanting our partner to feel so safe, so adored, so cared for, so wanted, so respected, so grateful, like how beautiful to take that extra moment and say, oh, thank you. And that's what love does. It's a holding environment. It is. Why with the blanket with my mom? The holding to make it safe, make it protected, to feel like you're not alone. And how amazing we are made for our bodies to need to open up to each other and go within each other. Mm. Like that thought was phenomenal. (laughs) We don't do that in anything else. I hold your hand and it feels lovely, but... There's not like an opening where my finger goes into your finger. What a glorious Mm. choice in creation. And then to have that be so erotic and so pleasing, and then to have our visual and our body respond in all the ways that we do. My Lord, that was perfection, the way that was created. I was thinking about kindness because kindness in a relationship and kindness to all beings, to all things, is that I wanted to ask you, how do you think kindness plays a role in fostering a positive connection with our partners? Oh, I think it's vital. I care about you. 
I will take care of what's important to you. I want what's best for you. I want to be there along the journey to assist you in whatever way. I carry you with me in my heart wherever I go. I don't really understand going into partnership if you don't feel that way. I know a lot of people don't. And then I know, okay, so there's a separateness here that I'm going to probably want to massage out a little bit. If someone says, I don't care about your feelings, my head doesn't quite understand Mm. that. And I'm like, how could you not care about my feelings? There's an analogy that I use. I don't think we spoke about it on the first time we spoke. We may have- ordering pizza. No, it's about tripping over a foot. Oh. I don't think I did. No, tell me about it. I use this in session all the time. If my foot is out and you walk by and you fall over my foot, you fall down on the ground. If my response was, I didn't do that on purpose, you're not going to feel supported. You're not going to feel loved. You're not going to feel cared for. Mm. That is what most of us do. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I think that's your fault. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. That's what most of us do when we come into conflict. If I were to say, oh my gosh, are you okay? You still might think I tripped you intentionally. You might. But there's a part of you that recognizes that I'm concerned. This is so important. If you are willing to be concerned about your partner, that's what kindness is. I want what's best for you. I want to help you. I want to support you. I want to be with you. If you trip over my foot and I say, oh my goodness, are you okay? Can I help? If you say to me, you trip me, I'd say, I am so sorry you tripped. My foot was out, but I didn't want you to be hurt. Could I please help you get up? You're going to receive me so much more. We get caught in who's to blame. And because of that, we lose or we let go of our willingness to care, to be compassionate, to be kind. It's such a simple shift. My son, I adore both of my children. I have amazing children. He would ask for things that I wasn't going to say yes to. And then he would be frustrated. And I got really good at saying, gosh, you're so frustrated with me. Honey, I'm so sorry you're so frustrated. And he would soften a little bit. And I'd say, this must be hard because you really want to go. Yeah, mom. And honey, I I really can't say yes because I do. If you bring that layer of, I care for you, 100% doesn't mean I'm going to do what you say, but I care. It's received so much better. And so that's what my book is, Speaking with the Heart. How do I care for you in your experience? That was my mom. How do I care for you in your experience? It's not mine. And I'm not going to go there. And I can't. I don't even know where the heck you are in your head or not in your head. But I can care that you're in a tough situation. And I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to be able to really change it. But I can care. It's what Viktor Frankl did in Auschwitz. Mm. When the guards gave him some like moldy piece of bread, he knew he was going to hate mankind. And he didn't want to come out of concentration camps hating mankind. So he said, they're concerned that I'm hungry. When they gave him a tattered blanket, he'd say, they're concerned that I'm cold. He was able to take what for me and for most of us would have felt like, for sure, inhumane treatment and still find a little speck of bread to appreciate. He held on to his soul by holding on to his compassion. Mm. He was really being tortured. And when he left... He thanked his captors. There is a place, if we are willing to, where there is always room for love. No matter how much we're being hurt, no matter how much we're being wronged, there is a place for you to hold on to the gloriousness of your spirit, of your soul, and not let that be robbed from you. Only you can decide that. And we let it go so easily. We let ourselves be veered so easily. And you know when you're in that place where all you want to do is offer love. And you know when you're in that place where all you want to do is make the person feel like crap. It's a gift to you. Viktor Frankl saved his soul. Yeah. And the souls of others. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Thank God he was there, but thank God the people had that beauty there and that crystallized truth. You can always love, always. Because the focus of love is not solely toward, also within. 
Mm. It comes from within me and I share it with you as I choose. If I share it with you, I don't lose any. And if I share it with you, it doesn't mean you're some wonderful, amazing, incredible person. It just means that I feel you could benefit from some love. And that's up for you to choose or not. So when you bring in kindness, Mm. when you bring in compassion, that is what you're doing. I will bring forth love because I feel this moment will be more sacred, more special when I bring forth this. I've had a lot of people ask me, why is my book not called Speaking From the Heart? And I was incredibly intentional about that. Speaking from means I take something there and I and I pop it with. It's the bridge. It's the umbilical cord. It's the connection. Do you talk in your book about intentional love versus happenstance? How do you interpret this distinction? And do you believe intentional love or do you know intentional love is more meaningful in a relationship? Yes. So my daughter and I both love the ocean. Very sacred place for me. We both love the ocean. So when she says, do you want to go to the beach? I'm going to say yes. But that's also a place that she also loves. It's an easy one. She's going to want to be there anyway. I love theater. Ted didn't. And he would say once a year, pick a show. This is important to you. I want you to have this. And he didn't go and complain. He didn't say the tickets were too much. And he didn't turn it into something negative. So we'll use pizza. If I say, oh, Peter, would you please order me a pizza? If you order vegetarian, and that happens to be my favorite, it's not that you're loving me so much. It's that we have similar tastes. If I like anchovies and cranberries, and you think, okay, I'm going to order the pizza. I've got a vegetarian. Oh, dang. (laughs) Heather likes anchovies and cranberries. Wow. Okay. Let me go get her one too. You've had to think about how to love me. It's bliss when we are similar. It's bliss when we have the same tastes and we like the same things. It's just super easy. And we enjoy that time so much because we both enjoy it. And that is a beautiful connection. And that is very important. And that's part of the reason you fall in love. In addition to that, there's a place of, and I will love you beyond where it's easy for me. I will love you beyond where it makes sense to me. Basically, I'll love you beyond where it also loves me. This is it. I will love you beyond where it also loves me or I love the experience. And I'm going to love you in the way that you will feel loved by me. This is about you. This isn't about, this sounds great, doesn't it? Let's go. That's a communal. And that's why you're with that partner. If you want to be a blessing, if you want to be a gift, you go beyond what is natural. You go beyond what is just your your similar interests and traits and habits and preferences. And you go to, and where else can I bless you? That is not of me. My daughter, she's such a love. She loves to give. She loves to give. When she used to live in my house, she's older now, but when she used to live in my house, three days before Christmas, my presence would go up on the mantle. And every day she'd say, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Aren't they pretty? Oh, mom, wait, wait. And I would just light up because she had such joy in wanting to make me happy. And then I would open the presents and she put a lot of time into them. A lot of them were handmade. They were just beautiful. But truthfully, it could have been a stick of gum. I, I, was, I was already so loved. I was so loved because she wanted me to feel loved. It's her presence. That's the intentional. Mm. Yes, it's my presence. In my presence, there's that place of, I give this to you. Not just, I'm already here, so why don't you join me? It's that I'm going to go out of my way and do this because you're special to me. And I want your day to be more magical, more wonderful, more beautiful. And if your partner is somebody who does that, treasure it. And if it's not your big love language, please say thank you. Because when you don't, you're basically saying, don't love me. And some people will say, I don't need all that to do. That's really more for them. And yes, they're doing it in a way that they're able to, and that works with them, but they're doing it to love you. I I used to like these candies called paydays. They're a salted nut roll. And they were really popular, like at Halloween time. 
And there was one time where Ted came home with a bag of them and he handed them a beaming, beautiful smile. I literally said, why'd you get those? And he looked at me and he said, because they're your favorite. I literally said, no, they're not. I don't really like those that much anymore. I like Snickers now. And I watched his entire face. I'm like, Heather, what did you just do? Why did I not just say, Ted, you're oh my gosh. Thank you. Why don't we share one? And why don't we save them for the kids for Halloween? Because we both are a little plump right now. This was so incredibly thoughtful for it, of you to do. I could have just said that. Nope. Wow. And so he walked away and he was hurt. And then I did what most women do. Oh, let's open up. Let's have one. He's, you don't like them. Why are we going to eat one? There was no coming back from no that. Back. You sent shafts into his soft parts. I did. And what a beautiful thing for him to be at the store, see a bag of paydays and say, Heather loves those. Let me buy a bag just for her. I'm going to make her so happy. Look what I've done for you. Wow. I had absolutely no kindness, no compassion. Mm -hmm. And so moments like that are part of what has helped me tremendously in learning this, but also then to bring that in my work. We reject the love we receive. I didn't need that. What I needed was this. I don't really want that. Now, here's something that's really important to know about us. When we're receiving, we then want something else. Often, we are made with a little bit of an insatiable hunger. The eyes want more beauty. The mouth wants more food. The, the body wants more orgasms. We want more breath. We are made to want more. And that's part of our survival. Like I can have a huge meal, but I need to want a, another meal. I need to want to sleep again. I need to want to procreate again. So it makes sense that in all the places you're being loved, you're not quite as aware of that need because it's being fulfilled. And then your focus turns into, well, I'm not being loved here. This is all true. However, it's really important to recognize all the places where your partner comes through. Mm. And sometimes we really don't. And there's a resistance in individuals in terms of having to ask for what you want. How do you suggest overcoming any resistance that a person might have in expressing their needs within a relationship? I'll make it super easy. Can anybody crawl into your head and know what you need? Can anybody? Can anybody crawl into your head and know this is the thought you're thinking? This is the feeling that you're wanting. This is the longing that you are having. Mm. I've never in my life gone to a restaurant and sat down and the waitress says, what would you like? And I said, I'm hungry. Okay. Well, what would you like? I'm hungry. Figure it out. I shouldn't have to tell you. Even if it was a restaurant I went to all the time, she would say, okay. The regular? Would you like everything you had yeah. last time? They're still going to chuck. If you ask me right now, when I come home from work today, what is it that I want to drink? Do you want water? Do you want sparkling water? Do you want tea? Do you want a big glass of wine? What do you want? I have no idea. I don't know what I'm going to want in eight hours. So how would your partner know? It's so silly for us to think somebody else should know what we want. Why should I know what you want? And isn't it beautiful for me to say, what would you like? How can mm -hmm. I most please you? I could just bring you the peanut butter sandwich, food. And you might be like, okay. But at some point when you've had it five days in a row, you're going to say, I don't really want a peanut butter sandwich. Why doesn't she ever ask me for what I want? Would you really want your partner? Here's a great question. You know why it's so important? It's because of the ask. If I just know exactly what you want all the time, you're going to get completely used to me and you're not going to appreciate me. I just know I'm perfect. I come through all the time. Isn't God, that nice? So boring. Like, you're so boring. I got like a little genie. There's no <laughs> surprise. I'm thinking I would like a peanut butter with apricot jam. Oh, so sorry. Ding. <laughs> In my head, peanut butter with apricot jam. I'm going to bring him that. In the beginning, it'd be fun. And then after a while, you'd be like, because part of what makes us so amazing is that we don't know. You're going to surprise me. What are you going to bring? What do you bring out of me that I don't have? Because it's not delighting. Part of the beauty is in the ask. Would you care enough about me that you would? It's the anticipation. So much of the beauty of everything is in the wanting of it. My book. I have been on this path for a year and a half. My book went live yesterday. A year and a half journey to get to this point. And I have been waiting for this point. But guess what? Now it's come. And so now it turns into, so how do I get 
reach and how do I get followers and what is the message that it brings? And now we're in a whole different journey. I'm not going to miss that part of the journey because that was wonderful. But there was so much excitement the last two days looking, not up yet, not up yet. Then it was partially up and it would say, here it is, speaking with the heart. It was on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and it would say, not available, not sure when or if it will be. And I'm like, what a message that is. And they'd say, you like, just publish that day. And I would look and I'd go back six hours later. And then yesterday I was on a podcast and she literally said, it's happening today. It's probably happening in a couple of minutes, 10 minutes after the podcast, it went up. But there's that place of the journey, mm. the wanting of, and all that you do to make that happen. You want the baby. Pregnancy is incredible. Writing my book, I cried when I finished. Mm. I cried. I'm like, you're done. I love you. And I'm going to also miss creating you. But look what you've given birth to. Yes, but that is a relationship. Exactly. Make it the same place. And so you want to know why you ask the question, because then you write another chapter. If I don't write, if I don't ask another question, I just stay in this chapter and this is all that we are. But when I say, hey, how about you and I go beyond? What could I give to you or learn from you or offer to you beyond what I have been? Let's move into a different chapter that we have never explored together because I want to be there with you. Take my hand. That's glorious. That's why we ask. I want to love you deeply, dearly, not just in what I know will work. Peanut butter and jelly works. It works. Homemade spaghetti with meatballs and garlic bread. That's going to be our lasagna, chicken parmesan, roasted turkey, beef bourguignon. At least in my house, they're all way yummier than peanut butter and jelly. So mm. there's the place of how can I bless you more? That's what the question is. How can I bless you more? Mm. How can I bring to your attention that I am loving you? That's what an ask is. If I just do, you recognize it. If I ask, it's highlighted. And then I can offer it to you differently. You've asked. Now you're waiting. And now I come to you and I say, here you go, my love. Let me bless you. Isn't that nicer than, there you go. Yeah. Knew you wanted this. You also mention in the importance of guiding your partner in the same way a chiropractor gathers information before treatment. How oh. can this approach be applied to communication and expressing needs in a relationship? Beautifully. What a fantastic question. When you go to the chiropractor, you say, My lower back's out. It really hurts. And I'm feeling it in my left hip more. And then the chiropractor says, okay, let me do an assessment. Let me check. Are you okay here, 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 here? And then they start working through you or adjusting. How's this? Is that okay? Do you want deeper? Same thing with a relationship. What is it that we want to talk about? We need to resolve the car issue. Okay. What is that we need to figure out? How we're going to pay for it? Okay. What are the challenges and the concerns and fears that we have? How do we walk through this respectfully? Because this is going to be a hard conversation. I want you to know you are more important to me than the car, but I don't know how we're going to come up with $3,000. So we get a little figuring out to do. And you start to say, okay, this is where it starts to hurt. This is the chiropractor adjusting. Do we need to stop golf lessons? Do we need to make our own presence? Do I need to add more hours at work? Do we need to stop the, the gym membership? Those are the adjustments. What do we need to do? What needs to be moved, shifted, aligned to get us to the place where we now have $3,000? What does that look like? And how do we come into, okay, I can go there no more. And that's the chiropractic adjustment. That's in the communication. We got to come up with $3,000. We do not have it. What are our options? And they hurt. If you're having to come up with $3,000, changing your budget hurts. And so there's mm -hmm. that place of being compassionate and kind with the other and working with them. What about your, let's say, I don't know what it might be, your nail appointment. Okay, but I'm on national TV and my hands are here all the time. So I don't think though, I think that's important, but I could stop the restaurants. Okay, let's stop the restaurants. There's some working through. And when you get to a place that's too painful, you say, oh, ow, I can't go further. I can't go further. And then it's important for the person to say, do we stay right here? Or do you want me to pull back a little bit? Stay right here. Okay. Is there anything you need from me right now? No, just stay right here. Okay. Okay. We can go a little further. Okay. It's pacing. And, and I check in a lot. I'll say like, how are we doing? I'll ask my clients, what's going on in your head? 
because I can see when they flip up into their head. And I want to know, like I've lost them from the heart. So what's going on in the head? Help me get in there. And then I can bring them back down and then we can work a little bit more. But I'm letting them know I care about whatever has led them to go back up into their head. And so to me, that's what you do in a relationship. How are you doing with this? Like $3,000 a lot of money. I know I'm really disappointed. I'm really angry with you right now because I think you blew when you took that job. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't think it would turn out this way. Are you able to go further? Do we need to take a little break until you're not so angry with me with what I've done? I think I need to take a break. Okay. Come back when you're ready. I'm really sorry. And then they come back and you say, I am so sorry. And the person says, I know, I know you didn't know. It sounded great. We said yes. And I wish you hadn't. And now we owe $3,000. Okay. So what are we going to do? So it's pacing. Mm. What is pacing? compassion and kindness. I'm in this with you. I'm not leaving. This is an us. Even if you're the person who totaled the car, this is still an us decision. So how do we do that as respectfully as possible? And I walk you through all of that in the book. And there's exercises about ways to step out of a fight so that you don't have to have it. I ask, what are the four most important questions to ask before any important conversation? It's gold. It's just gold, changes conversation tremendously. There's so much that we can do. And a lot of it is just by starting a conversation by saying, I love you and I care about you and I want this to go well. So at any point, you don't like what I'm saying or you don't agree with what I'm saying, would you let me know? I I can be really direct with my kids and I'll say, I'm losing you. I can feel it. And they're like, yeah, like what's going on? And this is hard, mom. I'm like, okay, then let's stay right here. How can I help you feel more solid in where you are? I'm embarrassed. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to cultivate that. So what's going on that's bringing that up? I don't want to be in this situation. Yeah, me either. The beauty in the book is what I've gleaned from it is before the conversation, there is compassion and connection first. Then there's connection. Connection. And then there's conversation. And there's conversation. And we do it wrong. We talk. And then we hope in our talking, we'll be connected. Mm. And then we're hoping our partner will be compassionate. I flip it. I care. Mm. And then we work on making certain that we're in good connection. I need to know where, what you need of me, what you don't want of me. There's some questions to ask before Mm. you do that. How can I help you feel safe in this? How do we have agreement? And then from that comes compassion. I looked up the word vulnerability a couple of months ago. I just felt the need to look it up. Though... I thought I knew what it meant. And when I looked it up, I was somewhat horrified. It said to step into something willingly, knowing you're going to be hurt. And I went, dear God, why would any of us do that? That's stupid. So I went, no wonder we all have this, oh, be vulnerable. Oh, I don't want to be vulnerable. Because we actually know what the word is asking. And I was saying in my head, no, it's not that. It's just like sharing. But no, it's not. It's opening yourself up when there is a perceived risk. That's Mm. stupid. We are a fight and flight animal. That is stupid. Let me jump out in front of the T-Rex and just hope (laughs) that they're not going to be their plant eater anyway. But let me jump in front of the saber-toothed tiger and hope he's not hungry. I think I'll jump in with a great white and hope he's had dinner. Oh, So I went, okay, so this is important. What do I do with this? And I said, okay, I'm not going to ask my clients to be vulnerable. I'm not. That's dumb. I'm going to say to them, can you be open? Can you come to your partner and say, I'd like to have this conversation and I can be open with you. Will you step in and be open with me as well? And if you get a no, then you say, okay, let me know when you're ready to. And at that point, I'll open. And until then, you respect it. And if you get a yes, then it's not really by the definition of vulnerability. It's a sharing, it's an offering. And that's really beautiful. You also share a personal experience about your late husband and the realization that you had to take the initiative in creating the changes that you desired. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation where taking responsibility for your desires led to positive outcomes? Oh, absolutely. That would be the book. It's going to be a relationship sometime Mm. in the next year or so. Now that the book is written, I can open up the space for that. But absolutely. But if you think about it, you'll love this one. It actually always is. Unless you are somehow, and most of us are not in a situation like this, where somebody else is truly in control of our life. Because even if my focus is, I will reject what I want and give to you what you want. 
I have chosen that. So it is actually always our choice. And when you give yourself that truth, how beautiful that is. So when you're in a situation where you're feeling like, I'm not liking, this isn't benefiting me. You, then you say to yourself, then why am I choosing this? I don't like lima beans. If I went to a restaurant and you say, Heather, I'm ordering you lima beans, I'm not going to like them. From your analogy, I just need to say, okay, but I would have chosen that. I'm not going to do that. I'm like, I don't like them. Kai broccoli, peas, kai green beans. How about asparagus? If I choose what you want, I have chosen what you want. Give yourself back your power. You chose. Foolish me. Choosing lima beans. I'm not going to like them. I already know it. Stupid choice. So yes, it's an everything. Now, when you know you're doing it for your passion, for the love that you want to give, for your purpose, woo, it feels amazing. And when you were doing it for the other, but you're doing it because you choose to, you want to, it's a glorious gift. And where we waste so much of our time is feeling like we don't get to choose. We have to. And in that, we lose either the gift of, no, I will do this for me, or what a gift this is I get to give to you. A yes is also a no. I said yes to you for today. Amen. Yes, I want to be with you. But that also means I haven't been able to do other things. So it's always both. So if I say yes to me, I have to in some way say no to you. So there's the place of recognizing that and letting yourself have the power, have the beauty in that choice. When Sienna says, I'm so excited for you to look at what I got you for Christmas, it's all me based. But she loves doing that. So mm -hmm. she gives herself pleasure. She doesn't say, oh my gosh, this costs so much money. And why do I have to get you presents? That's I successful. That's success yeah. because yes. if you truly love what you do, whether it's giving presents, that's the definition of success because that is your intention. You are steeped in it. It's part of you and you're part of it. Yeah. I'm going to live yeah. my life in speaking with the heart and what I do. I'm going to pick up the dog poops and be grateful I have this beautiful dog grizzly. I'm going to pay my taxes and decide that I'm grateful that I have this beautiful practice. I'm going to floss my teeth and be grateful I have them and I have a great <laughs> dentist. We have the choice of saying, mm. yes, I'm going to enjoy this in the ways that I can. I'm sweeping my floor. I can be pissed off and angry about it. There's lots of dog hair, cat hair, or I can say, I love my floors clean. I love my floors clean. I love my wooden floors. So when I'm sweeping them, I'm not thinking about, oh gosh, why do I have to do this once again? I'm saying, thank you that I get to have a house that has beautiful hardwood floors. I love hardwood floors. And people come to my house and they say, oh, you should have runners. People have told me that for 10 years. And I'm like, no, no. thank you. No. <laughs> They're like, but it's cold and your feet touch it all the time. I'm like, exactly. I love my hardwood floors. Mm. So there's that place of give to yourself always. Each moment. It's your life. What are you giving to yourself? What are you giving through yourself? What are you giving to others? It's always a choice. Even if we're going off in la land or we're watching TV and there's nothing wrong with watching TV, it's a choice. Mm. Be mindful of what am I choosing and how am I choosing it and how is it blessing me? Is there something that would be more serving? And sometimes you're going to say, no, I just need to relax. Awesome. Have a popcorn and soda and sit and watch the movie and have a blast. And then when it's done, say, what a fun treat that was for myself. Have a meal. And when you're done, say, gosh, what a delicious meal I gave myself. Wake up and say, oh, I'm so excited. I've got a day of magic and miracles. And I'm going to be so loved today. <laughs> I'm going to love so many. Who can I share love with? Oh, let's see. I hope it's like 10. What if it's 20? What if it's 30? If you wake up, someone said to me at one point that um, I am, how did she say it? I'm a manifester of miracles. And I went, I love that. I love that. So I wake up in the morning and I say that. What magic, what beauty, what joy, what love can be created today? And how can I help the world with that? How can I bring more light? How can I bring more joy? How can I bring more wonder, more awe, more laughter, more hugging, more connection, more openness? 
incredible things can happen. Yeah. I found a $10,000 bill walking my dog last year. And I called my kids and I said, I found $10,000. And they're like, what? And I sent them a photo and my son, bless his heart, is, mom, it's not real. I'm <laughs> like, what do you mean it's not real? Of course it's real. He goes, you can't put it in the bank. I'm like, yes, I can. It's going in my fairy fund. And he's like, what? I'm like, honey, I just got $10,000. It's just a piece of paper. So is US currency. I'm like, I'm putting it on my refrigerator. $10,000 is on its way. He's like, whatever, mom. It's still on my refrigerator. But something is going to happen. Maybe it's my book. I don't know. But something's going to happen. It's going to be $10,000 because that was a message I got. And it's going to happen. And it's going to go in the U.S. bank. And it'll be lovely. But there's the place of giving yourself the truth of, like, why would today not be an amazing journey? Or why could I not help it be a better journey if I'm in a really hard, dark place? How can I love upon myself in this day? to enjoy it as much as I can or get through it as smoothly as I can because we're in this tough place. It's a distinction between allowing the day to move into you and you moving into the day. So you just touched upon something that is so important. We tend to define ourselves by what's going on around us and then we'll let the situation dictate how we feel. If you start with being solid as much as you can be within yourself, and then you step into, then you don't lose your power. You're also much better at discerning, is this a place I want to be or is this not? Because when we let our environment determine it, we lose who we are. And then we're shifting and trying to figure it out. And we don't feel stable because we're not. We're trying to feel stable within something else, which never feels very stable because it can be pulled away. And we know that when you try to grab onto somebody and hold them, it feels great for a moment. Oh, I got you. And then very quickly we realize, but I'm holding you. Maybe you don't want to be here. Maybe you're going to leave me. Oh my God, what happens when you leave me? Because then I'm not all that I am with you. Oh, step up. I'm going to be as full as I can within myself. And I'm going to do a lot of work on that. And then I'm going to step in and I'm going to evaluate. And if I feel places and situations and people where there's alignment and where there's openness and where there's desiring, where there's questions, then I'll step in. But I don't have to lose me in that. Mm. Now, here's where it really gets so beautiful. When I know that and when I choose to not, if this is not the right environment, the very best thing I can do is leave and then go find an environment that says, oh, yeah, mother, because then I am embraced as me, not embraced because of them. And that's why our relationships fail. We don't hold on to the love of ourself. And so what we do is we need the other person to decide we can be loved. And then we're desperate and we're hurt and we're angry and we're mad and we're, we're resentful and we do awful things to get back at them. Whereas if I decide, no, I will love me. And then I come to you loving me. And then I say, Peter, how can I love you? I'm good. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be so easy to love. Just like we do communication backwards, we don't understand relationship in the most beautiful way. And the more we do, the more we can see the gift is really for me. I get to walk this life as full of joy and love and hope and delight as I desire. And I will play with whomever wants to play. And I'm going to walk away from who doesn't. I wish I had been taught when I was a child, like three, four years old, when you're on the playground and someone's really nice to you and wants to play with you. If you enjoy it, play with them a lot. And if someone's mean or puts you down or tries to hurt you, walk away. I wish I had been taught that. I was taught you have to make everyone like you. And so what did I do? Pleaded with the bully, begged with the bully, mm. tried so hard to prove myself to the bully. I wish I had someone say, just walk away. They're it's mean. It's an abandonment. You're abandoning your, yourself. Yourself, exactly. Yes. And you've mm. cultivated the soil so that oh. people can plant those seeds for those human skills to take root and to blossom oh, and flower and cross-pollinate and germinate so that they can pay it forward as well. You're going to fall in love with yourself more. Mm. And you're definitely going to fall in love with your partner more. That's the whole purpose of it. That's why I'm here. My daughter said to me, mom, if I think of a word for you, the word I think is 
graciousness. Ooh. Oh, I'm getting emotional. That is what speaking with the heart is. It's how mm. do you love graciousness? How do you love with honor? And that there's quite a bit that is in honoring who you were and who you came from and how you are and letting that be your truth. Because all of your life journey up until now is part of you. And it's important that's respected. It's important that's talked through. There's a great deal on triggers in my book. And what do you yeah. do with that? And anxiety. What do you do with that? Expectation. What do you do with that? Fundamental belief systems. What do you do with that? Because we then come to engaging differently. And so there's really helpful, beautiful exercises to understand your partner's past. We go into, if you will, trauma or difficult situations, things that created some core beliefs within you. And then your partner can help you change in your belief of yourself. And to me, that's what speaking with the heart is. Mm -hmm. How do I help you in this beautiful journey with me grow in who you are to be? And how do I do everything in my power to not hinder that for you, help you in that and celebrate how do I get to love on you in this place of transformation that we're going to be in together? My thought is like, what is the most beautiful Valentine's Day gift you could ever give someone that I'm going to completely change our relationship and cultivate more love and more connection and more compassion mm. and more tenderness? That's what I want this to be. And so the coming out was very mindful. I wanted it to be around Valentine's Day because I thought, what a beautiful gift this could be to your partner. For your child, if they're in a relationship, for your mom and dad, for your best friend. Yeah. So I'm just hopeful that it blesses tons and tons of people. Reading and going through the book, which I really loved, and it will make waves and it will resonate with those seeking not just relationship advice, but a transformative journey towards deeper connections. And I think it's a guide that transcends conventional relationship wisdom, seamlessly blending theory with the raw authenticity of your lived experiences and others' lived ex experiences as well. Your ability to dissect relationship dynamics or complex relationship dynamics and offer practical solutions that transform the book into more than just a theoretical exploration, but really an owner's manual for building, sustaining meaningful, and I say this, meaningful connections. For me, speaking with the heart, I found myself captivated by its holistic approach, tackling not only the surface, not just the width, but the depth. Don't come to transformation. You've got to get to the marrow. Exactly. Yeah. As an invitation to embark the readers on a transformative journey, not only within themselves, but with their partners, all your insights on family and money and the intricate dance of intimacy transcends. It goes beyond the ordinary and it fosters a much deeper appreciation for the intricacies of relationships. So I want to thank you so much for allowing me to read the draft copy of the book and where can people find you where can people find your book and do you have any passing words at all sure my website's probably the easiest place for people to find me so www.drheatherbrowne.com dr heather brown it's on barnes and noble and amazon right now so if you type in speaking with the heart, Dr. Heather, or speaking with the heart, Dr. Brown, it comes up. If you type in speaking with the heart, it does as well, but it's like down because it depends upon how many books a book has sold for where it ranks. So if you put my name in there, it'll come up quicker. If you go to like my TikTok, or if you go to my Instagram, there's a link tree. And the link tree also has a connection straight to Barnes and Noble and Amazon. So very easy. And words of wisdom. Yeah, treasure yourself. You're a glorious gift. You're a glorious gift. And what's within your heart, share it with yourself as fully and deeply as you desire. And let what you share with others be a beautiful gift from your heart. If they're not ready to receive it, you have still given. And that is so beautiful. But you don't lose because you have already given to yourself. And when you let yourself recognize that, you can 
be a person who goes out into the world and just shares joy and light a lot of the time. And it just feels better to like you than to hate you. It's just a simple truth. It's a whole lot easier being Heather, thinking Heather's goofy and silly and fun and light and joy than thinking she's stupid. She's an idiot. She's dumb. There's no point in her being here. It just doesn't feel good. Let it be okay that you're you. Mm. And the more time you spend on that, the more time you're going to start to really enjoy you and let that be what is coming out from the speaking of your heart as a gift for yourself. That's beautiful. So love our talks. And I'm so grateful for you in my life. You were just a glorious soul and friend. And yeah. I am deeply honored by you. Thank you, Dr. Heather Brown. And thank you so much for the holy work that you're doing. And thank you. What I see is a love letter that precedes any spoken word. And yeah. I've really enjoyed sharing this time with you. It almost feels like I'm sitting around having a cup of coffee with you and we're talking about your book, but I would urge listeners, go out and buy the book and let it seep into your sinews and use a lot of the tools in there. They are truly transformative and they do transcend conventional wisdom. So thank you so much, Dr. Heather Brown. So welcome. Thank you so much. Bless you listeners. If you have any questions when you read my book, please reach out. I'd be honored to answer anything that I can. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way. And follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep transcending your mind.